I'm not entirely sure I should be up here now. Mm. Don't know how I'm supposed to follow that. You guys are lucky I'm not an excessive weeper by nature. Well, now I'd rather just talk about what a precious thing it is we get to minister to Him and that we've been given the opportunity to offer that sort of praise that, that He's so pleased with and, that, and then He shares what it's like for Him with us. You know, maybe I have the wrong topic today, I don't know, but I've invested time in these notes. Um, maybe it'll tie back in somehow, we'll see. Um, what I thought we were going to talk about, I guess we'll, we'll try, is uh, the battle that there is over our mind. And, and then in a little bit of a uh, dovetail from what I spoke about last time, the victory that we have in Christ. You know, the battle begins with our mind and with our heart. Um, I mean, if you look all the way back to the very beginning when when sin was created, Satan convinced himself in his own mind. He created a lie in himself that God was not good and that the Lord was holding back from him and that he would be better off if he were in charge. And it's continued from there ever since. You know, the very first sin by God's children was because they believed that God was not good, that He had lied to them, that, that He was keeping something good from them and that they would be better off taking something that He said not to do. And then as a result, death entered. And we've been a slave to that lie and that death ever since. And so, when we look at spiritual warfare, primarily we have to battle over over our mindset and what we believe is true. And uh, the devil attacks us constantly, you know, sometimes it's uh, obvious and sometimes it's very subtle. Um, and no matter the circumstances in which he attacks you, I, I would probably venture to say that it almost always comes back to what it's getting you to think, like it's affecting your mind towards the Lord, it's affecting what you believe about Him, whether He tempts you to take something that's, that's not yours to, to sin um, with some lust of the flesh, you know, that is getting you, there's a fly in the air, likes to land on my face. Um, that, uh, He causes you to believe that what God says is not true and what you want is right, that that would be better, it'll feel good, um, when in reality, as we discussed last time, we know that that's just slavery. His mission is to destroy you. Um, but He makes you believe that your Father, your Savior, is, is wrong. You know, and then in partaking in that lie and, and submitting to that mindset, we show distrust in Him. We, it's, it's an awful thing when you think about it. And you know, a lot of the times when you're attacked, it's when you're weak and you're not thinking as clearly as you would like. And in general, we're not very rational beings. But if you look at it rationally, it's ridiculous that we would believe Him over our Father. When you look at the way He loves us, what sin is it that should be tempting to us when He said, you know, that's not good? Um, and He suffered so greatly so that, that we could be freed from that. When you look at how He loves us, it's just absurd to think that that he has anything other than our good, you know, in his mind. And if you were to study warfare at all, just like actual warfare in the flesh, um, tactics of fear and distraction, those are big, you know. Whatever the devil brings against us, it's usually very distracting from what you're trying to focus on, whether you're trying to enter into worship, and he just wants to put some evil thoughts in your head that that aren't, aren't from you, that they're just straight from Him, or distract you with something mundane that's not even 
sinful. It's just, you know, carnal. It's just uh, aside from entering into worship to minister to our Lord. You know, he hates that. He hates the power that there is, the release that there is, and the, the glorification of, of our Savior that there is when we yield our hearts and surrender to Him and we worship. And He'll do everything that He can to try to distract us from that. And, you know, as we were hearing this morning in Sarah's testimony and, and that song, it's such a precious thing to, to be able to come before Him and to yield ourselves up without fear in, in His perfect love just wanting to be close to Him and have Him do whatever it is that He wants to do. And then we get to, to lift our voices and our hands and, and just offer something pleasing to Him that blesses His heart. And I always greatly look forward to tonight and the, uh, the way the Lord shows up powerfully and just the opportunity to be in a place saturated with His presence and with worship and but the way that I'm wired is, uh, like Shane, I'm very analytical. And I will uh, think about something to death. And, uh, and I'll put too much pressure on something to be the best thing it can be. And I'll ruin it thinking about it. And it'll make me scared coming in the night that I don't, I'll, I can't even tell you how common it is for me to be easily distracted. Like I want to worship. I want to have a pure heart in that and, and to be undivided from the Lord and you know like the testimony we've heard many times with Brother Joseph getting distracted by a thought from the devil and jumping trying to bring the presence of the Lord that he's just offended back down um, that's a constant battle for me and and I hate that you know but but today we're, we're just gonna look a little bit at uh, at that battle I guess over over the mind and and some of the weapons we've been given. You know, something important to consider is constantly is where it is that you're weak, where it is that the devil will, will slip in and, and try to distract you and, and the pitfalls that he lays for you. You know, we've heard that preach before that he has a plan of attack to destroy you. And he's intent upon it and he doesn't rest in it. Um, he has that attack for everyone, and everyone's a little bit different, and he knows us pretty well. He knows where to hit, and we ought to be able to know ourselves well enough to where we can see that coming and preempt it, uh, preferably, you know. And uh, if you're looking at war or fighting or martial arts, you know, they say just being aware of your surroundings is the first and best thing you can do. Like, there's the most dangerous attack is the one you don't see coming, you know. So being cognizant of of where he's going to attack, where he's going to cause fear for you, where he'll try to distract you, whether it's a business that is falling apart without you here, or money troubles, or just fear in the flesh of being uncomfortable or embarrassed, whatever it is, you know. Um, I think we all could probably think on it not very long and and, and think of what it is for us. Something struck me during the sermon, I guess it was yesterday, Sabbath. We were reading in Numbers chapter 14, and we can go ahead and turn there. Starting in verse 8. Chapter 14, it says, If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? And I believe what Pastor said is that when we surrender to the fear, then we begin to take part in the rebellion. And you see the Lord's response here that they mistrust Him. They have no faith. 
despite what he's done for them, he asks, how long will these people spurn me? And that just really hit me yesterday in the sermon is that if we take part in that fear that the devil would bring in our mind of whatever it is, basically at the heart of it, fear for yourself and that the Lord is not right, that he is not true, and that instead what you, you think, what the devil would cause you to feel is right, that's at the heart of it all, of what we're looking at here in the mind. Then we take part in a rebellion against him and he feels spurned. And you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that, that happens in... Uh, personal relationships with people that we love. If you love someone and you're out for their good and then and they misunderstand something that you do or they just, they just get it wrong in their head and, and uh, they see it wrongly that uh, you've hurt them somehow or they just misunderstand the love that you had for them, that kind of hurts. You're like, what do you, why would you question what I'm doing for you right now? Why would you question this love? You know, and much more so, how must the Lord feel when He's lavished countless grace and mercy on us and love. And, and we find ourselves so easily dissuaded and distracted into thinking that, that he's wrong, that he doesn't love us. Because at the heart of it all, that's what he's looking for. Just, it says without faith we cannot please him. It's because we have to have faith in who he is and his intentions toward us. Then, then you know what he says is true and you don't have to understand what it is. If you, you look at Job... You know, when Satan asked for him, and I think about it um, often that we, uh, we get this insight into the situation going on there that he didn't have. You know, he didn't hear the conversation between the Lord and, and the devil, and, and Satan asked for him, and he attacked him viciously with the intent to separate him from the Lord, to get him to curse God and to be destroyed. And... At the end of it all, Job did not understand what was going on, but, but he, believed, he believed in the God that he knew so strongly that he could say, the Lord can slay me. He will kill me, but I'm going to trust him. You know, So it doesn't matter what these... And they were physical circumstances Job was struck with over a long period of time, I think. And, uh, but he believed in the Lord so strongly. He knew him that he could say that. And, you know, that's where, where we're all supposed to be in, in battling the things that the devil brings against us is it does not matter. Like Michael said, the Lord is enough. He's just enough. And he's all I need. And if I never saw the answer in this life, if, if I never received another thing, if all I experienced was pain from this point forward, he's enough and he's worthy to have my devotion. He's worthy to have my, my undivided attention and and my mind, my heart should trust him. You know, and he's, that, that's the battle that we're facing constantly, every moment. Um, it's crazy how quickly he can slip in. I prayed for weeks before this feast that the devil would have no place here, that the Lord would keep him out, he would cast him out, and uh, he wouldn't allow him in, that we would become prepared without having, and us not allow him in. And uh, this feast started out so great for me. Um, the Lord was just present here. The, the, the worship night we had on the first day and then the services the next morning, I could feel His glory and I could feel the heat of it on my face and my body. And, and then it wasn't two or three days in, though, that uh, the devil just tried to weasel his way in there. It was something ridiculous, you know, something that doesn't even bear mentioning. Um, but it was so distracting. And then I realized it, and it makes me mad, which is more distracting, that I'm mad that I'm distracted. Um, it just compounds with me, and, you know, I just had to pray about it and, and talk to someone and just, you know what, and, and just cast him back out, you know. He's slippery and he tries to get in, but we've just got to cast him back out. And, and the power by which we do that is not in and of ourselves. Um, I just want to look back at a little bit of that prophecy Sarah received that I read last time, the last part of it says, Come, 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 my bride. I'm a champion for you. Make your legs strong and run. And the, the part that says I'm a champion for you was really kind of resounding with me in what we're looking at today. And you can go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 20.
in verse 11. It says, but the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will utterly be ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. Yet, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous, who see the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have set forth my cause. Sing to the Lord and praise the Lord, for he has delivered the soul of the needy one from the hand of evildoers. And we were the needy one. You know, without him, this, we're just helpless. Without him, we're nothing, and we would just pray to the devil's schemes and his tactics. But he delivered us, and it says, the Lord is with me like a dread champion. And that just really kind of struck me. Sarah and I were talking about this on the way down here, just how powerful that is that, that he goes to battle with us. He went before us, you know, and that we can know if, if we rest in him and trust in him, no matter what the devil will bring against us, he's a champion for us. And if we run with him, then there's no weapon formed that can prosper. There's no attack the devil can bring that he won't turn to good and use against him. And we've all seen that. The devil will, will try something with us. And if you're submitted to the Lord, if you're faithful, in the end, the Lord will just attack the devil right back with it and do damage to his kingdom. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 63. We spend a lot of time thinking... Uh, how loving the Lord is, how precious He is, and the way He's tender with us. But I also like, in, in thinking about the warfare that we're engaged in, to think about how terrible He can be, you know, for our enemies, and uh, how powerful and, and scary. The word dread and that dread champion means awe-inspiring and terror-striking. In Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 1, now I don't know, for sure, I looked into it some, and commentators seem to think 63, 1 through 6, it doesn't really connect to the passage before it and the passage after it. It just kind of stands alone. And um, it just seems to me pretty plain that it looks like it's talking about Jesus, our champion. And he says, Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, it is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, and there was no one to help. And I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. So I believe that's the Lord's heart for, for us, how, how He goes after our, our one true enemy and, and the victory that He has already gained, like we talked about earlier in the week. You know, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He who is in you than he who is in the world. And I just love that scripture because sometimes the, the things that we battle and face and the spirit that the devil would bring against us, they seem so big and so unassailable and you don't see how, how it's going to work out, how there will be victory. But at the end of it all, they're so small. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So it doesn't matter how scary an attack the devil brings, whatever it is, we know that, that dwelling in us is the power to overcome. And, you know, the question is, is what is it that we choose to see? I mean, are we, are we going to see it rightly? Or are we going to see it by the eyes of the flesh? And 
by what Satan would have us see. Do we see the dread champion who loves us and suffered greatly to conquer for us? Or do we see the, the obstacle and, and choose to believe that, that God is out to get us, that He's out for our harm? And that sounds crazy, but we do it all the time and it's been done. Um, you can either have the outlook that Job had or you can have the outlook of Israel in the wilderness where they've seen the Lord deliver them on a mighty hand, like He did amazing things. I mean, who splits a sea and then crushes the army of the, of the, uh, the most powerful country in the world? You know, a powerful army. And he just destroyed them. And there's a pillar of fire. I've never seen a pillar of fire. You know, I mean, if you see that, the Lord is, he's, he's abiding with you. He's taking care of you. And then you get out and you get thirsty. And then you think, why'd you bring us out here to die? You know, I know we laugh at that. It just seems absurd. But we've done that. You know, and you could do it in a moment's notice with just choosing to receive a lie from the devil. When, like David was talking about, I mean, look at, just the power alone of your heart changed. Not to mention, if you keep a book of remembrance, all the things that he does, all the ways we've seen him move. And every time something was scary, every time something looked like it was going to get the best of you, the Lord has come through. You're here, you know? And if you're not, then you're waiting on him and his return. If you've died, I mean, why, why is that scary? You know, because... You know, it says with, with perfect love, you know, there, there can't be fear. And if He's dwelling in us, if we're yielded to Him, then His perfect love should be dwelling in us, and there should be nothing to fear. Michael and I were talking uh, the other night during the banquet that, I mean, what are you going to do to a Christian? How should you be able to scare us? Because we've already decided we're going to die. We already gave our life, you know, and everything else is just glory for Him. Everything on top of that, I mean, we... We long to have more crowns to lay at His feet. And you know, anything that we say we're not willing to go through, that's just robbing Him of a crown that we could lay at His feet. And let's look at John chapter 16. Verse 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. He's already overcome. The battle is already won. Our responsibility is just to submit to Him, to be surrendered and yielded to Him so that He can do what it is that He wants to do. In Revelation chapter 12, Chapter 12 and verse 10 it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, and he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And so he's already been cast down. You know, this, it talks about the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, and, and we're looking forward to that, uh, especially as pictured in these days. But in our hearts, he's already come. You know, he's already here reigning in us. And so we don't have to have to fear any attack the devil brings. And uh, when I was thinking about this, the, the lyric came to me from the battle belongs to the Lord that we raise up a standard, the power of his blood, the battle belongs to the Lord. And you see, it's, it's already won. The battle's already decided. It's just a matter of whether or not we're going to choose to believe that now or, or later, you know, all the little skirmishes along the way. And that part about raising up a standard, we heard some about it the night of the banquet, that 
the Lord's banner over us is love. And that the standard, the power of His blood, Jesus, is our banner over us. And if you just look a little bit at, at what a banner is, it was a standard and a signal of war and destruction to the nations. You know, so the Lord raises up His banner over us. Jesus is lifted up in our life. And that's a sign to the enemy that you're destroyed. You know, that's the thing to fear. And a banner is something that you rally under. If a battle is kind of going south, I like to, uh, the movie The Patriot comes to my mind when at the end, and it's the last push for this battle to, to defeat um, the British forces and the militia is just, they're scared. They've been decimated a little bit and they're, uh, they're retreating. And uh, Mel Gibson's character sees the flag, this tattered flag laying on the ground because the man who was carrying it was, was killed and so it's laying on the ground and he sees everyone retreating so he rushes to that flag and he lifts it up and he just waves it on that hill, you know? And then he just reminds people of what they're fighting for and we know that we're fighting for the Lord and that they, the troops rally around it. They come back to it and they charge and they, with few in number, you know, with um, inferior firepower, they, they take that hill. I mean, they have to come back up the hill now because they've run down it and, and they destroy the enemy. You know, and then what Jesus says, our banner over us, that's what we're fighting for. That's what we're looking to. He's what we rally around and what we rally under and he's who we follow and uh, an example of that I really like is Exodus chapter 17. Starting in verse 8. And then it says, Amalek came down and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed, and we held his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar there and named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. You know, so as long as that banner is lifted up, if Jesus is lifted up, then there will be victory. And that's, that's our part, is to make sure that He's always lifted up in us and that we're submitted to Him. And I have several scriptures that uh, I wanted to try to make it through at the end here. And I uh, need to leave Michael some time too. So we'll try to move a little quickly through these. Um, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So, in the way we're looking at this today, you know, any, any light that the devil brings is. is a, a lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we have to take those thoughts captive. You know, we're warring in the spirit. It seems like a more mundane thing in the moment, you know, what you, when you're attacked and it's just in your mind. You're not thinking about war necessarily. You're not thinking about um, Jesus' victory in that. You're just dealing with it and battling it, you know. But to see it rightly, we are warring in the flesh. You know, we're, we're given power to destroy those lofty things raised up against Him. 
in James chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Submit therefore to God, or resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I love that scripture now. You know, when, uh, when we really do submit to the Lord, and then also we're resisting the devil and what he's trying to bring, he will, he will flee. I mean, that is true. What, what God says is true, and I've personally experienced that, where it was during worship I was trying to uh, press through. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the devil just had these thoughts in my head. And they were just wicked thoughts that I just, I didn't want any part of, you know. And then I felt like they had come for me. And I was like, what is the, and it was like a barrage. This was not like one of those things where it's a little distraction. It was like an onslaught that I couldn't do anything about. And uh, it, it completely ruined the praise service for me. I just... I was not there. I was just dealing with this, and I, I couldn't get rid of it. And uh, the rest of the service, I believe, it was very difficult. And afterwards, I was like, I am in no way, shape, or form able to fellowship with anyone or be around anyone. It was, it was killing me. So I just left, sat in my car, and then I was praying about it, and it was difficult. And uh, I was distraught. Like, I was kind of bawling before the Lord, like, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. Um, Because this was kind of a thing that had been protracted off and on. And uh, I remember the scripture and I just said, Lord, I submit to you and I don't want this. So make the devil flee. And then like instantaneously, he was gone. Like it just abated and and I praise him for that. And I'm not saying it always works exactly like that. That was nice. But that that was over a long period of time. I had dealt with these same thoughts. Um, This was like the culmination of that battle. And uh, that's just awesome, the, the power that he's given us in the name of Jesus. Let's look at Luke. Uh, no, let's skip to First Peter chapter 5. I'll just paraphrase in Luke. Basically, Jesus told Peter that uh, Satan had asked for him. Actually, in my translation, it says he demanded him to sift him like wheat. And uh, it's kind of a scary thing when you just hear that part, but said Jesus prayed for him, you know, and his concern has always been on us and, and bolstering us up and making sure we have what we need. And so we can take heart in that, confidence in that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, says, Be of sober spirit, and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. You know, so the devil's prowling around like a lion. And I think it's interesting, too, that Peter wrote this, who the devil demanded um, to sift him like wheat. And uh, like I was talking about earlier, he's prowling around like a lion, seeking to devour us. So be cognizant of of, uh, the ways that he's going to try to get at you, you know, be familiar with where you're weakest and, and, and take guard against that uh, preemptively. And just two verses, uh, I'm sorry, three verses quickly to close. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 13 says, oops, oh, well, that's 2 Corinthians, no wonder that doesn't look right. There we go. Verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. I think it was interesting. Paul told them to act like men. You know, just man up. Be alert. This is war. You know, you don't have time to, to be entangled by the things of this world. Act like men and be strong. Strong in the Lord, not in our might, not in the flesh, but in Him and what He's provided In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, we see basically the same thing. The Lord says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? The Lord's not really pulling any punches with him here. He's like, I told you to do it. 
Just be strong. Be courageous. Don't tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is wherever you go. He's with you wherever you go. There's nothing to be afraid of when we look at it rightly. Just like David was talking about with David and Goliath yesterday. It's like if you see it rightly, if you see it the way the Lord sees it, the way it actually is, then the Lord is with us. Don't tremble. Be strong and courageous. And in closing, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Kind of to sum it all up. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And like we've been talking about, you know, with that faith that you believe what the Lord says is true and that He is able, He's capable, He is mighty. It doesn't matter what He throws at you. It'll be extinguished. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.